Oh, hi there. Welcome to Liberty.me Live. Hi, audience that I hope is out there. Uh, we're here for what's going to be a really exciting show, I hope. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and I'm here with Sheldon Richmond and Walter Block. And you might know me from the internet, but more importantly, you probably know Sheldon Richmond from his work in the Freeman Future of Freedom, lately on Reason.com, and his own uh, free association blog. Sheldon and I also do a free association podcast every two weeks here on Liberty.me. Um, and he's been known to call himself a left libertarian if you pester him at Students for Liberty, speaking personally. <laughs> um, and we also have Walter Block, who is a, I don't know if I should read the official names, but he is the eminent scholar, chair in economics at uh, the J.A. Bott School of Business at Loyola University. He is a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn. And he is the author of, I counted 12 books, though I could be uh, miscounting, including uh, Defending the Undefendable. And uh, we're here for what is going to be a discussion, not a disagreement, I think was the idea, or not a debate. But basically, I think we want to start with Sheldon telling us in a couple minutes what he considers left libertarianism um, in itself and also kind of separate from just saying libertarianism. So if you want to just... <laughs> okay. Let me just take a few minutes just to uh, kind of kick things off, uh, and provoke some discussion. Uh, gosh, I hope uh, you said something about under pressure, I, I would admit to call, I would call myself a left libertarian. It makes it sound like I'm somewhat reluctant. I, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so... So uh, I don't know what you meant by that, but I'll, I'll let that go. Um, I think what left libertarians have in mind, I speak for myself, of course, but I think there'd be agreement from uh, my colleagues at the Center for a Stateless uh, Society and other, other, uh, other you know, uh, free-floating left libertarians. But the, the idea is uh, there's a historical element to this, and then there's, there's a whole series, I think, of things that we could call emphases and uh, nuances. Um, well, first of all, we're libertarians. So let's get that out of the way. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Rothbardian. I'm a non-proviso Lockean. Uh, I could come up with many more uh, titles for what I am. Uh, I learned my libertarianism from uh, this gentleman right here, Professor Block, who I first saw, although I don't believe I met him, but I was in the same room with him in 1969. That dates us, doesn't it? <laughs> New York City. Uh, a debate over anarchism between Carl Hess and and uh, and uh, uh, Jerome Tuchili, as a matter of fact, you may remember that. Uh, uh, I and and so I learned my libertarianism from Murray Rothbard, from Laura Block, from Carl Hess, from Roy Childs, from a, a whole group of people, uh, and I think that's what gave me this left uh, flavor, leftist flavor from the very start. Uh, just to say something historical first. And this is brought out in a nice essay that you can find online by uh, Jeff Riggenbach called Why, Why I, I Am a Left Libertarian. Uh, if you look historically at, at the left, the, the nature of the left and the right, we see that, the, the, and, uh, and Rothbard writes about this in, in places like uh, the prospects for left and right, the prospects for liberty. If you look at the French Assembly after Napoleon, we, we see the, the, the emergence of the terms left and right, and they came from the, the physical fact that you had the left and right of the National Assembly, and on the right you had the, the, uh, the defenders of the old regime, the reactionaries, the people that wanted to restore the monarchy and, and all the, you know, mercantilism and all the bad stuff. And on the right, you, on the left, you had uh, the forces of, they were somewhat disparate, they didn't agree on everything, I'll give you an example in a moment, but they were the forces of progress, of, uh, of liberty, of anti-authoritarianism, uh, all the good things that we that we that we pray. So uh, historically, I think you could put libertarianism uh, on the left naturally. Now Bastiat sat on the left when he was a member of the assembly. He sat on the left side, uh, uh, which shouldn't surprise anybody given just how I defended it. And one of his colleagues on the left was a uh, was a uh, J. P. Uh, Proudhon, who's all who's one of the first people I believe, maybe the first person to call himself an anarchist. And who sometimes thought to be uh, not, not friendly to the free market, but 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 actually he was pro free market. If you actually read his works, I know you can find statements where he says property is revolutionary, property is the bulwark of liberty, property is this this and that. He was sort of in a way he was sort of postmodern. He liked contradictory <laughs> statement statements, but certainly the tenor of his work is 
pro-individual freedom and against the state. And, he, and while he and Bostia had many disagreements over economics, they debated the nature of interest and things of that nature and had a lot of differences, uh, nevertheless they had a, a lot in common too. So that's the historical aspect. Uh, the, 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 the point about nuance and emphasis is, is that the, well, the people that call themselves left libertarians are tapping in to the earlier libertarian movement in this country, the late 19th century, uh, beginning maybe the mid 19th century, into the 20th century, the people surrounding, Je uh, I was going to say Jeff Tucker, Benjamin Tucker, and his Liberty magazine, Lysander Spooner, who was uh, getting older in the, uh, at that point, but still was an inspiration to them, and the people around Tucker. They, they were pro-free market, and I would disagree with a lot of their economics. They weren't Austrians. They were mutualists, and I think there were issues there about land ownership and things that we could certainly take issue with. But their concerns were similar to other leftists. They were concerned that with people who were dis disenfranchised from society, people who didn't, groups that did not have rights, women, minor, uh, minorities, uh, the disadvantaged workers had under under uh, the prevailing economic system, which is known as capitalism, but uh, and uh, I don't mind uh, using that word disparagingly, but it was not the free market. And then the other historical point that left libertarians like to make is that the the uh, the economic system that developed uh, from the time of the Industrial Revolution onward was not essentially free market. If you look at the history of it, you had peasants kicked off land, beginning with uh, King Henry VIII and all the way through the enclosure uh, acts of the, uh, of, the, of the parliament, kicking people off the land, um, leaving them no choice but to uh, move into the cities and, and, and join the fact and, you know, go to work in the factories, which, you know, you, you may say was a great thing, but the point is it was rooted in force. They were dispossessed of, of land that they had been living on. Uh, so this is not hardly complete. I hope more and more will come out during the discussion, but at least I give you a flavor of, uh, of what it's about. Okay. Um, and I guess, Walter, we want to you know, generally respond to that, but also if you want to talk about, you know, if you disagree with Sheldon's interpretation of these big libertarian figures, or, you know, what's just, you know what, I'll trust you, just, you want to respond to what Sheldon said, and we'll take it from there? Well, I'll give my opening statement sort of uh, similar to uh, Sheldon's. Uh, I, I want to say that Sheldon and I have been friends for, I don't know, more years than either of us want to uh, go back, if I can speak for both of us. And uh, uh, this is sort of a debate among friends, but it is a debate because I do sharply disagree with uh, Sheldon. Uh, not so much with his, his historical analysis, I think he was uh, pretty accurate, but I, I want to show you a picture that I just drew. I hope you can see this. It's sort of like a teepee, uh, an Indian teepee, uh, where there are sticks on the top, and then the NAP, or libertarianism, is right where they all cross, and then below the NAP is deductions from libertarianism. That's the way I see libertarianism, and the, uh, the, the, the dot in the middle, right over here, is the non-aggression principle, and uh, based on property rights, based on homesteading, and, and that's pretty much what libertarianism is. I'm not a left libertarian, nor am I a right libertarian. Uh, they call me Walter Moderate Block, and I'm a moderate <laughs> here, because uh, there are right-wing libertarians too. Uh, Ron Paul is a right-wing libertarian. Hans Hoppe is a right-wing libertarian. Uh, 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 Sheldon and uh, Roderick Long, if I can characterize them as left-wing libertarians. I'm neither left nor right. Uh, and I don't see the issue between... Uh, I, I'm against left and right. I'm just in favor of libertarianism, plain and simple, vanilla libertarianism. I think both left and right are thick libertarians. To me, the, the debate or the disagreement I have with Sheldon is not so much left and right. I'm against both. Rather, it's thick versus thin. And uh, I'm a thin libertarian. I wish I lost a little more weight. Uh, <laughs> but that's a different uh, dimension of thickness and thinness. Uh, I'm a thin libertarian, and, and I believe that only uh, the non-aggression principle based on uh, homesteading is, is libertarianism. And anything else, anything else uh, uh, is uh, superfluous or is an attempt to hijack libertarianism. And I uh, oppose this, and I think both left and right libertarians are trying to hijack true uh, libertarianism and true libertarianism is based on uh, just the non-aggression principle and that's it. You don't have any other views qua libertarian. Now as a person we have all sorts of views about 
I don't know, hierarchy and, and discrimination and gays and blacks and Jews and bossism and unionism and feminism and all that stuff. Uh, and we can have uh, many, many views on all these things, but not qua libertarian. Uh, I wear these glasses, these are my libertarian glasses, and I say that libertarianism is a theory of what is just law. And just law says, uh, you know, there are some people say that libertarians think there is no law, but I'm not one of those. I think there are legitimate laws, and they're all based on the non-aggression principle. For example, uh, no murder, no rape, no theft, no fraud, no uh, trespass, uh, whatever. Th those sorts of things. And that's all that libertarianism is. And when you start saying, well, how should we uh, view homosexuals, say? Uh, the left-wing people would say, well, uh, they're great guys, so we should uh, respect them, support them. Uh, uh, like, uh, what is it? The, there was a homosexual couple that went to either a baker or a, a, a florist or a, a somebody else, a, a photographer, and said, come to our gay wedding and, you know, uh, we'll pay you. And they said, no, it's against my religion. Uh, you know, so there is some... Uh, and. Uh, I, I would support that. I would support their right not to involve in, in uh, themselves in the wedding because of their religious uh, principles or what have you. And I think that the uh, the uh, the right wing libertarians would, would certainly support that, and the left wing libertarians would not support that because they think that uh, we owe uh, some sort of respect uh, to gays or to women or whatever the group is. And uh, to me, that smacks of positive rights. Uh, in libertarianism, there are no positive rights. There are no positive obligations. There are only negative rights. Uh, namely, I have a right not to be molested, not to be killed, not to be raped, not to be murdered, not to be stolen from, and that's it. I have no right to respect. Uh, and I think that the, the left-wing libertarians, uh, or the thick libertarians, uh, especially, well, both, uh, uh, th uh, left and right, but the thick people uh, think that, you know, somehow we owe respect to people. I don't think we owe anything to anyone unless we're contractually obligated. You know, if if I sell Sheldon my car, then he's obligated to pay for it uh, based on the agreed-upon amount. But he doesn't owe me anything. We owe nothing to anyone else except to keep our goddamn mitts off of them <laughs> and their property. That's all we, uh, we have owe to anyone. So um, I, I uh, think that this is really the dispute that I have with uh, Sheldon. I don't really have any dispute about what he said about the French, uh, you know, on the left and on the right. I think he was pretty accurate uh, there. All right. Um, as I'm, we have a, there's a million avenues we can take from what you guys both said. But if um, Sheldon wants to give another, do another well, res response and then quick, response. A quick commentary, because. I don't know, I don't think I'm clairvoyant, but what I thought was going to happen, as I thought about this this afternoon, actually, before this, is in fact happening. Walter and I are now in the position of debating two different questions. He's debating one, or discussing one, and I'm discussing something else, which is very, very different. I, I, I feared that we were going to see a conflation of two different issues, left libertarian versus non-left libertarian. You could call it right or or middle of the road libertarian on the one hand so left versus non left on the one hand and thick versus thin on the other those are not the same debate and they must be kept separate and I'll tell you why there are quote right libertarians or non left libertarians who are thick Randians are thick libertarians right Randians say you gotta you gotta accept the metaphysics if you're gonna fully understand the politics that's a thick libertarianism it's hardly left libertarianism on the other hand I can imagine, although I'm not sure I know any, I can imagine a left libertarian who's not a thick libertarian. He can take all these positions on, uh, you know, labor and uh, women and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state. In other words, have all that sort of left, uh, you know, concerns, and yet, and, and yet say, uh, I'm not talking about private racism, nonviolent racism, I'm only talking about the state. That would be a thin left libertarianism. So... Uh, I, is this what are we discussing? Are we discussing thick versus thin or left versus non left? I came prepared to discuss left versus non left. I could discuss thick versus thin, but that's a separate issue. I want the audience to understand that those are two different issues and they really must be kept separate. I uh, agree entirely with Sheldon. There, there are two different issues, and I don't know why he's reluctant to use the word right. He says uh, there are left libertarians and then non-left libertarians. I, I, I'm more, I, what's the word, symmetrical. I, I believe in left and right, uh, and I oppose both. And I don't really want to talk about left or right. Uh, 
<laughs> I want to talk about thick or thin because that's where I disagree with Sheldon. Uh, but that's I, not, that wasn't the topic. I mean, I'll discuss it, but that wasn't the topic. Well, I thought it was the topic. <laughs> we had. A, I was asked to discuss left libertarianism. It was that okay? But I don't mind. I can discuss. I can discuss thick, thick versus thin. Okay, great. Uh, because I don't think we have much of a disagreement. I'm neither left nor right. So I don't want to defend the right because I attack the right, and I don't want to defend the left because I attack the, the left. I just want to uh, attack all fixers, uh, whether of the left or the right. I don't care. I think they're equally uh, fallacious or equally misconstruing libertarianism. Uh, I, I had some article, uh, I forget the exact title, it was something like uh, libertarianism is neither left nor right and, and then I criticized three guys on the left and three guys on the right and I'm, I'm a moderate, you know, I'm just a plain old down the road, middle of the road uh, libertarian and uh, I don't uh, have any accoutrements. Now one of the things, Sheldon, that you do say is, um, I have so many uh, notes here I can't even find it. Uh, I'll just have to remember it. Uh, you said uh, something like, um, uh, it's a fallacy to say that, that thick libertarians is lot, sort of like hanging um, pet pet peeves or pet uh, things like a, a thing on a Christmas tree, uh, hanging uh, things. And that's I think that's what thick is. I mean, look, I like chess, and I don't like checkers. And if I started saying that somehow chess is more libertarian than checkers, I would be making the same mistake that all the fixers make. Uh, all the thick libertarians, because what they do is they just get their own pet um, likes, and they say, well, that's li libertarianism. You, you can't be a racist, or you can't hate, or you have to be a nice guy, or Jeff Tucker says you can't be a brutalist. I say nonsense to that. The, the, key, to, the key element to libertarianism is the non-aggression principle, and only the non-aggression principle. And once you get off on that, and you start saying, well, hierarchy is good or bad. Now, the right libertarians would say hierarchy is great. Uh, the left libertarians, the thick ones, would say hierarchy is no good. Uh, uh, Roderick Long calls about, talks about bossism. My view is, as long as it's voluntary, it's irrelevant. Uh, the only uh, view that I have on bossism or hierarchy is that if it's voluntary, it's fine, and if it's uh, not voluntary, if it's coercive, it's a violation of the non-aggression principle, then it's no good. You know, I used to be in an orchestra, and the uh, conductor would tell the wind players when to breathe. And if you if you play the piccolo or or uh, you know uh, the trumpet or something, you breathe at the wrong time, he'll uh, get you know stop the whole orchestra practice and yell at you for breathing at the wrong time. Now you can't get more hierarchical than that, but yet every member of the orchestra is there on a voluntary basis, and I see no uh, objection to hierarchy. And yet uh, the the thick left libertarians oppose hierarchy, the thick right libertarians love hierarchy, and I'm indifferent to it. I can I can assure you that left libertarians and neither left libertarians nor thick libertarians nor left thick libertarians nor thick left libertarians oppose uh, orchestras or team sports. I mean, in one of your articles, you said uh, if my view of libertarianism is correct, because I had linked it to individualism, you said libertarians ought to be against uh, team sports, which I got a pretty good laugh out of uh, because it made no sense. Uh, there's not uh, no left libertarian or thick libertarian or any any uh, you know uh, uh, permutation you can come up with uh, is against people joining together in groups to do things either to accomplish tasks or have fun or entertainment or whatever the thing. That's not what that's not what we're talking about. Uh, you, you know, you said you, uh, you you made a point about uh, my shying away from the word right. It wasn't shying away from it. It's just that you did set up three categories. I mean, there are three categories. There's left, there's right, and then there's a libertarian that, that you claim to be, which is neither left nor right. So I just wanted to say the non-left. That would include both you and the right. I was just trying to be, you know, I was just trying to save time, economize on words. <laughs> okay, fair enough. On this, uh, there are really now three things on the table. There's left versus <laughs> right. This thick versus thin, and now this individualism versus collectivism. And I oppose the uh, denigration that virtually all libertarians uh, do for collectivism. Somehow they're against collectivism. To me, if you're seriously against collectivism, you have to be against team sports, you have to be against orchestras, because they're not individual uh, pursuits. Uh, we're probably just having a verbal dispute, because I don't believe for a minute that you're against team sports or, or orchestras. I, it's a verbal dispute. I, I don't like bashing collectivism. Here I'm, I'm sort of being a leftist, because the right-wing 
like Ayn Rand thinks collectivism is evil, and you know a lot of right-wing uh, libertarians think collectivism is evil, and I'm sort of defending collectivism if it's voluntary, and I also defend individualism as long as it's voluntary. For me, the key is, is it voluntary? Does it violate the non-aggression principle? And if it doesn't, fine. And if it does, no good. Whereas but that's a, but Walter, that's inherently individualistic, because who's volunteering or not volunteering? Individuals. That's all there are is ter in terms of acting. Who you know? You talked about non-aggression and the the other side of that coin, a term you didn't use, although I'm sure you embrace it, is self-ownership. Well, who who is the self-owner? And individuals are. So it's inherently individualistic. It has nothing to do with opposing group activities. It's because those are individuals joining together. The reason voluntary collectivism or voluntary socialism is okay from a libertarian standpoint, and I agree with you on that, is because why? Because individuals freely joined into those groups. That's all there is to join into groups. So it's based on recognition that individuals are self-owners and therefore you owe non-aggression to those self-owners. I have a, listen, I agree with you. I think we're just having a verbal dispute here. Uh, no, that's not verbal. You rejected individuals. <laughs> and it's, I can't tell how pedantic this is, but it does feel like you both are loudly agreeing. So I'm hoping we can get a little back on track. There are a thousand avenues to pursue here. Go ahead. I, um, speaking, you know, from my own perspective, I tend to agree with things that Sheldon writes, except for his self-descriptor of left libertarianism. I'm still a little <laughs> at a loss on that. Um, so, I mean, that's something that I want to pursue is that I still feel like I don't have a handle on, I mean, the historical thing is one thing, you know, sitting on the left side, Bastiat, Proudhon, all those people, but to me that doesn't quite lead to, and that's why today I want to attach the word left with all of the other baggage unfair or not to my libertarianism when you, you know, Sheldon and, and, and Walter, you both agree on so many things and... I feel like you're on the same side at the end of the day. Um, so, all right. You know what, what I want to do actually is I want to talk about if we can do this differing. Um, basically, what 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 Sheldon and and what Walter think capitalism means, and what socialism means, and whether there's a disagreement on those definitions. Um, and yeah. you know, and I guess maybe logically. We, I don't, I've kind of lost track here. I apologize for that. Um, but if Sh Sheldon, do you want to talk about capitalism and how you, you're not as fond of, you know, a positive yeah, I'll, spin on that word? I'll say something briefly. And socialism too, even if you want. About socialism and capitalism. Capitalism. I won't say a whole lot about capitalism except to say aesthetically, I think it's a terrible word. It sounds like it privileges capital or owners of capital. I mean, we wouldn't talk about landism or laborism, but those are all uh, production factors of production. Uh, the the word capitalism was not coined, or capitalist was not coined by Marx, as popularly thought. It was coined by a pro-free market radical, Thomas Hodgkin, whose economics were were faulty, I fully concede, but nevertheless was a hardcore free market libertarian, as hardcore as they come, and and effectively an anarchist. I don't know if you use the term. He he disparaged capitalists as as the owners of capital who 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 profited from artificial property. Which and and it was this it, it's this by that artificial property he meant what we would condemn as artificial property. He wasn't talking about honest homesteading, legitimate homesteading. He was talking about political privilege. Okay, that's what I'll say about capitalism. Uh, by the way, capitalism as a word was disparaged in the old Freeman by Clarence Carson, not Kevin Carson. Clarence Carson, no relation, as far as I know. So there is some pedigree for not liking that word for finding good reason to find fault on socialism. We use the term differently today than it was used in the, even in the United States in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Tucker frequently called himself a socialist. It was more of an umbrella term. It meant it meant an anti-capitalist, and by cap, anti, by capitalism, of course, they just they meant what I just said, where capitalist or the employer class is privileged through state what we call corporatism today, or crony capitalism, or or, or state subsidies of, of one kind or another, patents. Uh, the, the money monopoly, the land monopoly, and the uh, tariffs. So that's what socialism meant. It was much more of a general umbrella term. If you go back and read Tucker's stuff, you'll you'll see what he says about this. Bastiat, by the way, one of the, one of the first leftists, I'm proud to say, 
has has a great great stuff in his his magnum opus, uh, uh, the economic harmonies, about how what the what what the competitive free market does is move is moves utility or moves value. I think he used the word utility from the realm of private property to the communal realm. These are his terms, and you can find my article about this explaining what he meant by it. And he predicted that he'd be accused of being a communist because he took this position. Obviously, Bostet was not a communist. So that's my take on those, those words. Okay. Uh, Walter, do you have a response? Or in general, you know, I, the differing I, definitions? Yeah, I agree with Sheldon 99.9%. I, I would just answer it with slightly different body English. Uh, economically <laughs> speaking, socialism means the uh, ownership of the means of production. Uh, land, uh, labor, uh, labor too, capital. Uh, you can, uh, under uh, economic socialism, you can own your, your pants and, and your... your <coughs> eyeglasses and, and your personal effects may be a bicycle, but you can't own a truck and you can't own uh, capital equipment. Uh, the usual um, uh, comparison, well, my understanding of capitalism, uh, I'm learning from Sheldon, I didn't realize, uh, uh, I thought that it was a Marxist smear, but uh, Sheldon said it came before and I respect his knowledge of this history. Uh, but it's sort of like the N-word for black people. Uh, they, they were called the N-word and then they used it uh, to describe themselves in a positive way. Uh, similarly, uh, capitalism, the way I understood it before Sheldon, I, I have no reason to doubt what he says, is that it was meant as a slur against uh, capitalists and um, it was used by capitalists as, a, as an honorific, just the way blacks use the N-word. So, um, and I think Sheldon was quite right in pointing to the difference between crony capitalism or state monopoly corporate capitalism on the one hand and laissez-faire capitalism on the other. Uh, the uh, present Pope, Pope Francis, and a lot of critics of capitalism don't make that distinction, and yet that distinction is absolutely crucial. If you make your money based on uh, legitimate property and, you know, uh, buying and selling without fraud, then, uh, you know, we have no problem, or I think libertarians have no problem with inequality. But if the way you make your money is with uh, tariffs and government subsidies and bailouts and other things like that, then that's very bad. So I, I don't think there's a dime's worth of difference uh, between Sheldon and me on, on this issue. Now, I, I think there, I wonder if there's a little bit more because sometimes it feels like part of the difference is that Sheldon and sort of his ilk believe that cronyism kind of has deeper roots within, say, just the United States to make it easier, and that, you know, the more Walter side of the argument is that one could kind of sweep off the cronyism and that there is more of a, a delicious, purely free market, pure business, pure voluntary, that it's easier to get to that. Whereas, it, to me, it feels like the left argument is more that it's so deeply entangled with government and coercion that maybe it's not that easy. I don't know if I'm off base there, Sheldon. I think we or... can get a little too wrapped up in the particular terms. Look, uh, the definitions of words are not metaphysical, right? We don't look <laughs> in the sky and say, what does capitalism really mean? Oh, it doesn't mean that. It really means this. Uh, you know, I'm a Wittgensteinian on, on this matter. A uh, word means, uh, the definition of a word is how we use it. Now, you know, if you're being clear to people and ca you're using capitalism to mean laissez-faire, free markets, you know, I, I, I'm not going to stamp my foot or argue or say you're evil or anything of that nature, as long as you're clear. The fact is, people think capitalism is what the United States has today, uh, the regular people as well as a lot of intellectuals. It's not enough to say to them, no, it's not capitalism, it's not capitalism. That doesn't convince people. The point is the historical system that we've inherited from England all the way up till now is not the free market. There's there's corporatism, there's, there's government intervention running very, very deep. There's not just a thin layer of regulation that we need to scrape off and then we have laissez-faire. It's not like it's not like uh, frost on a windshield where you go out with your scraper and you know you you know you just need to work a little bit to get it off and then everything's fine. No, the, the, given the centuries that this system of privilege and exploitation has existed, the, the roots run very, very deep, and it's not just a matter of getting rid of some, you know, Dodd-Frank and the Fed, and it's much deeper than that. So that's what left libertarians mean. The other thing, and I have to bring up a, a distinction or a term I think that's very valuable, uh, which is contributed by Kevin Carson, is this idea of vulgar libertarianism, and I think it's very important. Uh, it's when libertarians, and they do it all too often, 
defend the behavior of companies today, especially big companies, big corporations, today as if they were operating in a free market. Now, it makes no sense to complain about government regulation on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I guess you're resting on Sunday, on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, defend companies, you know, defend their conduct as if it were occurring in a totally free market. And that makes no sense. Well, I really wasn't talking about how hard it is to get rid of the crony capitalism stuff. I agree with Sheldon. It's pretty hard. It's deeply embedded. But, you know, we have, uh, we have serious disagreements that we're sort of avoiding. And I'd like to get into these serious disagreements, like this business of exploitation. Uh, Go ahead. You know, uh, women make less money than men. Blacks make less money than whites. Um, is this exploitation? Uh, I would say, well, if it comes from government uh, interference, yes, and otherwise not. But it's not uh, per se uh, exploitative. Uh, sweatshops are not per se exploitative. Um, I don't see that uh, unionism is, is a good thing, whereas a lot of um, uh, thick libertarians of the left variety see unionism as a good thing. They see hierarchy as a bad thing. Um, I gave this case of the baker and the photographer and the florist that were told that uh, by human rights commissions, I think the, the baker was fined $130,000. Uh, Sheldon, let me ask you, how do you um, uh, analyze from your perspective, whatever you, however you want to call your perspective, this law that requires uh, people to uh, help with uh, gay weddings? Well, I and every lift libertarian I know is against uh, these uh, so-called anti-discrimination laws because it's, it's the state using force against people who have not used force. That should be a simple one. I don't know why anyone would have any doubt about my, uh, my position on that. There's some confusion, I think, with some of the people who call themselves bleeding heart libertarians, and they have that blog. Notice I never use that term. I've never appeared on that blog, and I don't regard myself as a bleeding heart libertarian, although I care about people who are downtrodden, but I don't use that brand because I think some of them support annual income, guaranteed annual income, and stuff like that. That's got nothing to do with left libertarianism. You'll know, I don't think you'll find an endorsement of that at the at the Center for a Stateless Society. I've certainly never written uh, anything anything like that. Um, but I want to say something about labor and hierarchy. Uh, first of all, I don't like unions that are simply uh, you know bureaucratic outgrowths of the state, which is what current unions are. I, I'd rather I I, saw, I I prefer the Wobblies who objected to the Wagner Act and all that stuff because they knew what was happening. Labor was being co-opted by the state and made junior partners in the uh, in the corporate state. Uh, on hierarchy, the concern I'm speaking for myself now. I may uh, there may be other left libertarians who will take, have a slightly different take on this. The problem with hierarchy, in my view, is that it is it is in, encouraged, induced in various ways by the state. For example, if you block off routes to self-employment through, and Walter will agree with me on this, zoning, licensing. Uh, taxation, regulations, if you make it tougher for people to work for themselves, you're then pushing them, in effect, the state is, into wage employment, into hierarchy they might choose against if they were free to choose against it. That's, that's what we draw attention to. Sweatshops, uh, I understand the economic argument that in very poor areas of the world, uh, they don't have the, the, the degree of wealth and technology and, and uh, capital that, that that we have in the, in, the, in the rich West. That's not the argument I make. The argument I make is before, before I declare sweatshops in Sri Lanka or someplace uh, uh, okay by libertarian standards, I want to know what the state has done in league with big corporations, multinationals, to block other routes for the poor people and the peasants of those. Have they been kicked off the land? Have they been given very little choice but to work in those places? Then I am not going to give a libertarian blessing to sweatshops. And that's what the sweatshop defenders miss. They just look through a straw, you know? They look at a straw, they look at the sweatshop and say, well, it's a poor area, what do you expect? Yeah, take down the straw and look at the bigger context. How has the state, in league with big companies usually, and big landowners, given those people almost no choice but to work in those factories? That's, that's what a lift libertarian is well, drawn to, and I think the non-left libertarians are oblivious to it. They never talk about that. They I, just I, say, I don't think, workshops is voluntary. I don't think that's true. I mean, uh, any libertarian worthy of the L word uh, would uh, be concerned about that. But, you know, you have to do a little ceteris paribus here. Uh, let's stipulate that in Bangladesh or wherever the, the bad country is that the uh, 
people were kicked off the land and there were regulations that they, they couldn't set up their own companies and all sorts of uh, 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 crony capitalist crap, uh, fascism, economic fascism was occurring. And now um, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford comes in there and she uh, opens up a sweatshop and the way I tell my classes, I ask, well, is she offering a higher or a lower or the same wage as that was prevailing. And let's say that Kathy Lee Gifford herself, the sweatshop lady, had nothing to do with kicking the, the people off the land. She was totally divorced from that. I would say she's a good guy, and uh, I expect you would agree with me, Sheldon? Uh, well, often they do have something to do with it. I don't if know about Kathy Lee Gifford herself. To... Often they do. It's like, it's like Walmart and eminent domain. They're not just an innocent bystander saying, oh, Look, we can have this land, okay. Stipulate, ju just arguendo. I've never, I've never called for any level of government or the United Nations to shut down sweatshops. What I've done is broaden the context and say, before we give libertarian blessing to a sweatshop, I want to know the total situation. Yeah, but that's if, if, she, if, if Kathy Lee Gifford unwittingly is benefiting from statism, then we should identify that. I didn't say close it. Well, I said get rid of the uh, the privileges. Realistically, is there a business in on the planet that that doesn't occasionally slightly benefit from statism? Well, there's degrees, sure. Uh, I mean, there, you could. It's yeah. impossible to in our world. It's impossible to have you know maybe no benefit. But come on, there's a well, there's a big difference between Donald Trump using the state to take people's homes and some little mom and pop store that has to get you know a permit from the local government. Well, mm -hmm. I, the only thing I disagree with you, Sheldon, on this is that you're uh, claiming that this is a monopoly of left libertarianism, and I would say all libertarians worthy of the L word would uh, agree with you, and, and I resist the notion that this is somehow a monopoly of left libertarians that are looking uh, for state uh, interference. But I'm, I'm glad to hear it. But they don't talk about it. Let, look, uh, there's no positive obligations. Everyone can't talk about everything. But the point <laughs> is, if we stipulate, posit, arguendo, that I or you, we go to Bangladesh, and you and I have never had anything to do with any land grabs or any anything, and we now set up a sweatshop, uh, and we're benefiting the people because we're offering them a better job than uh, would prevail without us, right? In that very narrow context, yes. Okay, fine. And so we, we but, have. You, know, you, say, you say no libertarian would disagree with this. I agree. When you bring it to the libertarian, non left, he'll agree. But the point is, he never thinks of it himself. He praises sweatshops. You can read John Stossel I, I now, until, now forever to the end of the world about how great the sweatshops are. You never see it mentioned they exist in a political context. How can uh -huh. you leave that out of the story? Well, look. Uh, Stossel is libertarianism 101, and. We, we'd you have guys to, are on a level that's. <laughs> I, I'd like to. Fire. I'd like to raise a different issue because I, I don't believe that anyone is obligated to say anything. I, 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 you know, you can only criticize people for what they say. You can't criticize them for what they don't. Well, say. Well, wait a second, Walter. If somebody never mentions sweatshops, fine, I won't criticize them. But if you mention sweatshops and praise them and never say anything about the wider political economy of those countries, then that is something to object to. If you I want to be quiet about sweatshops, fine, I, I won't pound you for not talking about it. I believe in specialization and division of labor and not everybody has to say everything oh, and I think it's unfair okay. to, to criticize people for what they don't say. I think it's only fair to criticize people for what they do say. So let me now criticize you for something you do say. You keep talking about um, promoting liberty. And you say that uh, the, the problem with nonviolent racism or nonviolent sexism or nonviolent uh, whateverism that you don't like is that it'll, uh, it won't promote liberty uh, that well. And uh, the people on the, the, the thick people on the right would take the opposite point of view. And, and I, um, I like to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ignore those questions. Uh, well, not ignore them because I'm interested in what promotes liberty, but I want to distinguish what promotes liberty from what is liberty. And I fear that you and um, other thick libertarians, uh, uh, you, you, I can't blame you for the bleeding heart libertarians, but uh, there are other people. You mentioned Kevin Carson. I reviewed his book in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, and I thought it was just an awful book. And uh, Roderick Long is sort of, uh, I think, a uh, 
a philosophical buddy of yours, and you're always and ever talking about how best to promote libertarianism. Now, I'm interested in how to promote it, but much more am I interested in what it is. And my claim against you, Sheldon, is that you conflate those two things. You keep talking, when we're trying to talk about what libertarianism is, and I say it's just the non-aggression principle and nothing else, and you start saying, well, but you have to be opposed to racism or prejudice or this or that, uh, because these are ways uh, that if you're not opposed to them, you can't promote liberty. And I accuse you of conflating these two very different issues. Okay, let's be precise about what I've said. And, I, and I've, I've drawn on the work here of, uh, uh, of another left libertarian, Charles Johnson. Uh, and you, you can find his uh, Libertarianism Through Thick and Thin in, in The Freeman. I published it when I was editor of The Freeman. We are talking about thick libertarianism now, not left libertarianism. Uh, the, the point is not that being a racist is unlibertarian. That would be a, uh, an incorrect way of saying what it is we're saying. Well, what we say, what, I've, what I say, and, and uh, uh, again, drawing on Charles's work, is that people are libertarians, hopefully, for a reason, right? They're not just, oh, I feel like being a libertarian. If you said, why are you a libertarian? Presumably, they could give you some reasons, which are rooted in some facts about human nature and the world. Uh, so your grounds for, you have grounds for being a libertarian. Now, the point about thick libertarianism is this. If if um, if you see people in society, and you know this is very context sensitive, so if, you know if it's one or two people, it's nothing to be worried about. But if you see a society, uh, you know, uh, uh, heading in a direction where they're committed to things which conflict with the basis of libertarianism, the founding principles of libertarianism, then that is a matter of concern to libertarians because you'd be concerned about the future of the society as a libertarian society. In other words, there are things for libertarians that notice and take concern about, qua libertarians, that are not strictly about non-intervention because libertarianism is based on something. And if the, 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 the foundation of libertarianism is being eroded by people accepting attitudes, racism is a good example, sexism, uh, that's something for libertarians to notice and to want to address, not call in the state. First of all, Hopefully we're in an anarchist society. There's no state to call. Not to use force, but to call attention to the fact that people are living by values that conflict with the foundations of libertarianism. So it is related to libertarianism. I, I sharply disagree, and I'm glad we've come to some disagreement because otherwise, you know, we're, we're, we're agreeing with each other too much, uh, <laughs> and we do have some uh, sharp differences. Now, I disagree with you uh, talking about the basis or the ground or the reason for libertarianism. Let me push up my uh, chart here, and uh, what I have on the top here is the basis or the grounds or the reasons, and different people have different reasons. Some people are, are libertarians, and I define libertarianism is the NAP, the non-aggression principle. Some, it's because of religion. They're religious fundamentalists and they think God tells them to be libertarians because, uh, you know, the non-aggression principle is biblical. Uh, then other people are atheists. And, uh, and Ayn Rand, uh, she deduces it from A is A. Don't ask me how she does it, but she deduces libertarianism to the extent that she's a libertarian, although she rejects the word. Uh, yeah. Then there's uh, uh, natural rights, there's Hans Hoppe's argument for argument. There are many, many different reasons or grounds or uh, bases as to why people are libertarian, and I don't care about them. I, I think, uh, well, I shouldn't say I don't care about them. I'm interested in them, but I am... Uh, trying to, you know, I'm trying to put the blinders on like a horse has blinders, and I'm just trying to figure out what is libertarianism, and I'm not so concerned right now with how to promote it. And uh, by the way, I think that if you start with this uh, business, I, I think you're really uh, in the business of hijacking libertarianism, and, and I resist that notion. I, I don't want libertarianism hijacked, and I think if you insist on your views, you shouldn't call it libertarian. You should call it, I don't know, I was thinking of a nice word, maybe humanism, because, you know, brutalism is uh, opposed to humanism, why don't you call yourself humanist and leave us libertarians alone, us libertarians who are defined as thin libertarians, whereas you thicksters, whether of left or right, I don't care, you should go off and become right-wing humanist or left-wing humanist, because the issue of what promotes libertarianism uh, is, uh, I, I think, a separate issue. Uh, before we can figure out how to promote libertarianism, we have to figure out what it is, and you are 
uh, messing up what it is. You're saying somehow that if you're a sexist or a racist or a non-violent one, of course, uh, that, that somehow that's incompatible with libertarianism. It might be incompatible with the basis or the grounds or the reason that some people have for libertarianism, but it's not incompatible with libertarianism because libertarianism consists solely of the NAP. Well, a couple things. Let me put on the record that I oppose hijacking unless it's voluntary on the part of all parties. I just want to make, make sure that's clear. <laughs> <It's> hijacking, man. <laughs> uh, hijack. Oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and to keep it, to keep insisting that libertarianism is, is nothing but the NAP. By the way, I call it the NAO. It's the non-aggression obligation, not just the non-aggression principle. Mm. It's an obligation. Ah, oh, people don't <laughs> like that word. But what, what is it if it's not yeah. an obligation? Uh, anyway, uh, it's not enough to say it's only this. It's only this. It's only this. You're right. Many people people have many different uh, foundations to their libertarianism. Some some have none at all. They just say, I'm a libertarian. I don't know why. I just am. I like it. It's sexy or something like that. However, that doesn't change the... You know, I'm not a subjectivist outside of economics. I'm an objectivist, small o, in the Greek sense of ethics, uh, outside of economics. There are better and there are worse foundations for the case for liberty. And I, first of all, I hope people aren't making weak or poor uh, defenses of liberty because that's no good for the future of liberty. We need people making solid defenses. So there are better and worse cases. I think there is an objective case for liberty. And therefore, people could be taking attitudes who are libertarians that erode the best case for libertarianism. I'm concerned about that qua libertarian. That's all I'm saying. That's all thick libertarianism of my stripe is well, about. Well, I mean, so f I mean, fundamentally, if you're prodded, you're not saying you know a personal racist is not a libertarian. They just what they diminish right. libertarianism. They have. I, I wouldn't. You could be a libertarian and a racist. I'm not denying that. But you could be, you be by being a racist, you, you're holding values or commitments, value commitments to things that erode the, the best foundation for libertarianism. Therefore, I am concerned about that as a libertarian. Again, not about an isolated person. I'm not a busybody who's going to check up everybody's attitudes. But if you live in a society where you see more and more uh, you know, dislike of blacks because they're blacks or Hispanics or women or you know, whatever, the gays, whatever the group is, and I'm living in that society and it's a libertarian society, I would fear for it, therefore take notice of it, and wonder, okay, how can we, through peaceful uh, pro uh, propaganda, education, uh, persuasion, um, show people that those attitudes are uh, jeopardize the future of of the libertarian system? You see, what you're doing, that's, that's what you're doing, not so subtly, is you're switching the topic. I'm talking about what libertarianism is, and you're talking about the best way to promote libertarianism. As far as I'm concerned, the best way to promote libertarianism, I hear I'm a subjectivist. I look at the two people who have been most successful at promoting libertarianism, head and shoulders over anyone else, and I come up with Ron Paul and Ayn Rand. Now, look, Murray Rothbard is Mr. Libertarian as far as I'm concerned, but he didn't really convert masses of people. He was more of an intellectual converted you and I personally and other people like us but in terms of uh, mass conversion <laughs> of libertarianism it's Ayn Rand and Ron Paul and yet the two of them were almost opposites I mean Ron Paul is a sweetie pie and if you call Ayn Rand a sweetie pie she's gonna bite your head off so I deduce from that that there's no one right way to do it. And let's take homosexuality. Hans Hoppe makes the point that if we uh, give in to homosexuals and, and we respect them, then uh, we'll, um, uh, we won't promote liberty. You would take the opposite point of view, and I don't give a good goddamn about that right now. I mean, I'm interested in it, but right now I'm trying to discuss something else. I'm trying to discuss what is libertarianism, and you keep saying that part and parcel of it, although you did just say now that uh, you can be a, a racist libertarian, well, if you're a racist libertarian, then we have no arguments because that's, that's I mean, I think you can be a hateful libertarian or a racist or sexist, whatever, but, but this is very, very different th than thick libertarianism because the way I understand thick libertarianism is you add things to the non-aggression principle like uh, anti-racism, anti-bossism, anti-this, anti-that, or pro-feminism or pro-unionism uh, or whatever it is. Uh, then you've not, not read the stuff. You've not read the stuff, Walter. If you say that, it's a confession that you haven't read the stuff. Read, read uh, John, Johnson's done the best stuff on Thick versus Thin. Read his full article at his website, radgeek.com, and you'll see what it's about. And you wouldn't be saying the things you're saying. I a person, that. Look, a person, uh, you could have a, a pacifist racist. 
who believes in property rights through homesteading. There's no self-contradiction there. There's, there's no logical absurdity there. A, a person can be a pas total pacifist racist who believes in uh, uh, you know, homesteading uh, as a source of property. Uh, so that person's, I will agree, that person is a libertarian, but that person also has commitments, deeper commitments that conflict with the best foundation for libertarianism. But I, but That's they, what they, they, might, they, they might conflict with the best foundation for libertarianism, yeah. which I disagree with, but they don't, dis, uh, they, they're not inconsistent with libertarianism itself. And, and the question of what the best... Well, I've said that. Yeah, yeah, he said the question, that. The question of what the best foundation is 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 a, a very different question. L let me offer something that it's uh, an important question, and it relates to the topic. A Canadian libertarian uh, offered. He said that he wants a situation where a gay couple can defend pot with their guns, sort of touching all bases. So this is Tim Mowat, uh, who's the leader of the. Hmm? The problem that I have with, with the, the thick libertarianism is I'm a big tent kind of guy. I want hippies and lefties and guys with a, a pince nez and, and guys with tuxedos. I, I want everybody to be a libertarian, whereas the left libertarians are, how shall I say, not respecting the right libertarians, and the right libertarians are not respecting li the left libertarians. And if you want to have a big tent, you, you have to have fewer and fewer criteria. And if you keep saying, well, if you're a racist or a sexist or, or you're anti-homosexual, whatever it is, then you're conflicting with the basis or the grounds of libertarianism, and, and then you're a second-class citizen, you're not really a good libertarian, um, that's a problem. Uh, I don't see how it... Uh, it's part of the educational process. It's not reading anybody out of the movement. It's it's uh, it's 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 fine with uh, I'm fine with a big tent, but it's engaging in a sort of a you know if you hold uh, contradictory uh, principles or contradictory uh, you know uh, 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 commitments, it's a, simply a Socratic exercise to say look how this conflicts with this. These two things you hold, look how they're in tension. Uh, they're they're in tension with each other. So. It's a process of trying to teach them that you should be a libertarian all the way down. In other words, maintain the integrity all the way down. It's like turtles all the way down. It's respect for individuals all the way down because they're self-owners, which is the basis of libertarianism. Oh, no. Respect for individuals is a positive right. I mean, this, no, is, anathema. Is. this is anathema to libertarianism. Let, let me let me get in a few words, uh, Sheldon. Uh, I think this is anathema to libertarianism. This is really in, in positive rights territory that we have to respect people. You you can uh, denigrate people. Just keep your mitts off of them. Well, I didn't call for anybody's mitts being on anybody. I think the audience will back me up on that. Uh, I didn't say uh, most of what you just attributed to me. Uh, <laughs> what I what I said was there's nothing wrong in pointing out to someone that they hold a, uh, a principle, a foundational principle, which conflicts with another thing that they profess, namely libertarianism. Libertarianism is about self-ownership. Why, why do we own on, you know, here's a question I never see you take off. Why do we own non-aggression to people? We own non-aggression. I never agreed not to aggress against you. That doesn't matter. If I, if I punch you in the nose and you say, hey, why'd you do that? And I say, where did I sign a contract saying I'd never punch you in the nose? You say, you don't even understand libertarianism. And you'd be right. I don't understand it. What's the base? So there's got to be some basis. And that basis has other implications. That's what you're trying to escape. Yes, there has to be a basis, but different people have different bases. And if you insist that your basis is right, what you're doing is precluding libertarianism. And you're con so, so concerned to promote libertarianism uh, that you're uh, weeding people out. Let's take the case of homosexuality. Now, this isn't my view, but I'm now going to pose as a right-wing uh, libertarian. And, I, and what I'm saying is that... Uh, anti homosexuality homosexuality is anti family again i'm not uh, this isn't my view i'm i'm just uh, uh, running this by you to see how you react to it uh, homosexuality is no good it's uh, uh, it undermines the family and the family is a, a, a part of uh, libertarianism and if we want to have libertarians we have to have families so really if you uh, favor uh, non aggression uh, non uh, what's the word, non-prejudice or non-discriminating against uh, homosexuals, then what you're doing is undermining the basis of libertarianism. How would you uh, respond to that? I'd say, first of all, you're wrong. <laughs> that's what I'd say to the person saying that. And then I would proceed to show why that's why that's wrong. It, the premises all, uh, are all uh, fallacious and the, all kinds of reasons. I mean, I could, I could go on and on. But that's what I'd say. Look, I, I'm, interested, I'm interested in liberty. And therefore, I'm interested in promoting liberty because how are we going to get liberty unless a lot of people believe in it? And I, it, therefore, I'm concerned that the best and the strongest case be put forth. 
that's why I try to promote the strongest case and, and teach people, hopefully people who are taking a, what I think is a weaker case or a bad case, will see mine and say, I hope I'll persuade them and that they'll therefore make a better case. I don't see how we can be interested in liberty but not interested in the best promotion of liberty. They go together. No, they don't go together. They're distinguishable. Uh, they're very, very distinguishable because if if we are so concerned... Look, I'm concerned about promoting liberty too. As you know, the, you know, we both try to promote liberty. I don't think that's a question. But there's a difference. There's a distinction. And, and before you can promote liberty, you have to be clear on what liberty is, libertarianism is. And what libertarianism is is just the non-aggression principle and nothing else. And when you start adding all these other things, uh, as you and other thick libertarians do, whether of the left or the right, then what you do is you um, misconstrue libertarianism. How can you promote something if you don't understand it clearly? You're begging the question because you keep saying over and over again, adding other things like personal taste. Like, I like red, so therefore red is libertarian. Well, I've denied have, that. You haven't you, refuted my case uh, for left libertarians. You keep going back to your uh, imaginary case. For left libertarian, where it is the Christmas tree, just hanging ornaments on that I like that have nothing to do with the tree or the holiday. The, there, there is a it's Christmas not that. tree. There is a Christmas tree, and it's hung with all sorts of irrelevancies. Uh, you have to be a feminist. You have to be pro-union. You have to be anti-hierarchy. You can't be prejudiced. Oh. All of this stuff. Yes. These are things on the Christmas tree of thick libertarians, and on the right, there are other things on the thick, uh, like Ayn Rand. You have to, I don't know, believe that A is A or have metaphysics and epistemology. You so clearly see the error of Ayn Rand in hanging things on her Christmas tree, but you don't see the error of you hanging things on your Christmas tree. You know, you know. Again, you keep saying that, but I keep saying that's not our case, and yet you keep, you don't believe me. Look, I learned my libertarianism largely from our old friend who we miss dearly, Murray, Murray Rothbard. If, and I wrote about this just not that long ago. If you read, last year I guess, if you read his greatest works of uh, political philosophy, The Ethics of Liberty in particular, and then in a more abbreviated popular form, For New Liberty, that's thick libertarianism. So Murray is both a thick, thick and a left libertarian. Because it's so rooted in, in the natural law of philosophy. The first several chapters don't even talk about liberty. They're all about natural law. It's thick and rich and about how it's our tradition. So you, you, by disagreeing with me, I, I, you know, you're free to disagree with Murray. That's not a sin. But let's put it on the record. You, you're going against Rothbard's entire presentation of liberty. Throughout well, his I'm, libertarian I'm, life, Murray was also a paleo libertarian. In, in well, a, later on, yes, a later iteration, and in but, his paleo days, he was a right wing libertarian, and uh, in this, he was a left wing libertarian. And I oppose both. I uh, am I favor thin libertarianism, and you, you know, you keep saying that that, that you're not um, adding uh, thing uh, ornaments on the Christmas tree. But you patently are. There are all sorts of uh, uh, things that you're adding on. I, I, I mentioned a couple of them, and, and you don't deny them. But is, what, is, tell me, give is me he one. Adding, the only excuse is that uh, these are more compatible with, with the bases or the grounds or the reason for libertarianism. And, you know, you say that I was wrong when I gave my homosexual thing. This is an empirical issue, whether promoting homosexuality will promote a, a free society or not. And it's way different. An empirical issue has got nothing to do with libertarian principles. And yet you're conflating these two. Uh, yes, it's, it's of interest to, to delve into these empirical issues, but I insist that before you delve delve into these empirical issues, well, you don't. Have, you could do it at the same time, but you have to distinguish that from uh, what libertarianism is, and in your effort to promote libertarianism, you're undermining what libertarianism is. You're adding all this other uh, Christmas tree ornaments. We're going in circles. You keep accusing me of doing things I keep saying I'm not doing, and I think I've elaborated on what I actually am doing, so the audience can see that I'm not doing what you say I'm doing. So. I don't know. We're just repeating ourselves. Okay. I, I think I'll speak for the two of us, and I'll say we'll have to agree to disagree. How's that? Okay. Now, Lucy wanted to get in there. Go ahead, Lucy. <laughs> All right. Um, it's still, as, as, good, as sort of good as this talk has been, it always feels like there's some point that keeps eluding both people when they make their points. Because I, for, I, one thing I was going to say is that by virtue of adding the word left to libertarianism, to me, that that is Sheldon and, and others saying that they stand apart from libertarianism, that they're not, you know, oppositional, but something a little different. And that, to me, is adding things. 
But by the same token, I feel like the things that Sheldon says are... It's a little unrealistic to suggest that, you know, he's not going to have sort of preferences. He's not going to push liberty in a certain way. He's not going to, because he's a tolerant person, suggest that tolerant does good. I think as a little, you know, the purity of pure libertarianism is... I don't know how, how well it applies even when you're talking about it because human beings always have these additional preferences. So that's my way of saying that you both make really good points and I'm kind of conflicted, uh, which is interesting. Are we talking about left or thick now? Because I'm a little confused. <laughs> well, I heard you, Sheldon, and this is the, the personal thing. I've been reading you since I was uh, 12 years old. And don't say I, it. <laughs> and I've had various revelatory experiences, like, of course, I didn't think about that, but of course. And so when I discovered that you decided, you know, the word left applied, and Anthony Gregory, I think we've lost to, as well, it did, it, it's, you know, I don't know, like, I'm more annoyed by bleeding heart libertarianism, because to me that suggests, by virtue of calling yourself a bleeding heart libertarian, you suggest that other libertarians are heartless, which really bothers me, because it seems like, you know, the, the, the absurd leftist critique of libertarianism, if you're against coercion, you're somehow heartless. Well, this is exactly what Jeff Tucker did. Jeff Tucker divided libertarianism into brutalists and humanists. And he was against the brutalists. And, and what was the problem with the brutalists? They just stick to the non-aggression principle. Well, I can't blame um, uh, Sheldon for what Jeff Tucker wrote, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I certainly uh, oppose this. Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, and I also oppose calling people left and right libertarianism. Look, the left-right spectrum is a horrible spectrum. We got to get away from left-right. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Stalin is a leftist, and and uh, uh, Hitler was a rightist, and yet the, there there's not a dime's worth. Well, there's a dime's worth of difference, a different <laughs> rhetoric. But they were just both mass murderers and both commies, or you know, was, the Nazis were just the uh, national socialists, and the other guys were international socialists. I want to get away from the left-right spectrum because I, I think you were absolutely right when you said that if you say you're a left libertarian, well, then there's something wrong with right libertarians. And if you say you're a right libertarian, there's something wrong with left libertarians. Why can't we just be plain old simple libertarians and insist upon the non-aggression principle? And then once we do that, then we can start worried about the, the best way to promote libertarianism, which is an entirely different issue. But if you conflate them, well, we're out of the hour and I don't know what to say, but... Uh, <laughs> That's that's my last word on it, and I'll let you guys have a, a, a last word, too. Well, just to take issue with something, Lucy, said, when you were 12, Lucy, I was only 13, and I wasn't writing much back then. So, uh, <laughs> I, object, I want that stricken from the record. The audience will please disregard that. Uh, <laughs> Duly noted. Uh, Sheldon, it's good to uh, uh, be together with you again. I uh, miss the fact that we don't interact as much because we're in different... I love you, Walter. <laughs> you know, one of my great regrets was when I was coming to Arkansas, you were leaving Arkansas. I won't say you were leaving because I was coming to Arkansas. <laughs> but, it was a, it, but there are no coincidences. <laughs> I love it. Take care. Um, you, did, you, did, you did hook me up at the econ, econ department at the University of Central Arkansas, and uh, as a result of that, I, for 13 years, lectured at the classes of our dearly departed friend Joe Horton, and that was because of your introduction. And uh, I was so, I was very sad when he died last year. Yes, yes, uh, he was a good guy, and um, I, so that, this and year, I'm, I guess. I'm glad you and I are friends, Sheldon. We um, always will be Walter. friends. Walter, great. Uh, Walter. Uh, nevertheless, they had uh, a lot in common too. So that's the historical aspect. Uh, the, the 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 point about nuance and emphasis is is that the, well, the people that call themselves left libertarians are tapping in to the earlier libertarian movement in this country, with late 19th century, uh, beginning maybe the mid-19th century, into the 20th century, the people surrounding, Je uh, I was going to say Jeff Tucker, Benjamin Tucker, and his Liberty Magazine, Lysander Spooner, who was uh, getting older in the, uh, at that point, but still was an inspiration to them, and the people around Tucker. They, they were pro-free market, and I would disagree with a lot of their economics. They weren't Austrians. They were mutualists, and I think there were issues there about land ownership and things that we could certainly take issue with. But their concerns were similar to other leftists. They were concerned that with people who were dis disenfranchised from society, people who didn't, groups that did not have rights, women, minor uh, minorities. Uh, the disadvantaged workers had under under uh, the prevailing economic system, which is known as capitalism, but uh, and uh, I don't mind uh, using that word disparagingly, but it was not the free market. And then the other historical point 
that left libertarians like to make is that the the uh, the economic system that developed uh, from the time of the Industrial Revolution onward was not essentially free market. If you look at the history of it, you had peasants kicked off land, beginning with uh, King Henry VIII and all the way through the Enclosure uh, Acts of the, uh, of, of the Parliament, kicking people off the land, um, leaving them no choice but to uh, move into the cities and, and, and join the fact and you know go to work on the factories, which you know you, you may say was a great thing, but the nature of the left and the right. We see that the, the and, uh, and Rothbard writes about this in, in places like uh, the prospects for left and right, the prospects for liberty. If you look at the French Assembly after Napoleon, we we see the the, the emergence of the terms left and right, and they came from the the physical fact that you had the left and right of the National Assembly, and on the right you had the the uh, the defenders of the old regime, the reactionaries, the people that wanted to restore the monarchy and and all the you know mercantilism and all the bad stuff. And on the right, you, on the left, you had uh, the, the forces of they, they were somewhat disparate. They didn't agree on everything. I'll give you an example in a moment. But they were the forces of progress, of uh, of liberty, of anti-authoritarianism, uh, all the good things that we that we that we praise. So uh, historically, I think you could put libertarianism uh, on the left naturally. Now Bastiat sat on the left when he was a member of the assembly. He sat on the left side. Uh, uh, which shouldn't surprise anybody, given just how I defended it. And one of his colleagues on the left was uh, was uh, J. P. Uh, Proudhon, who's all who's one of the first people, I believe, maybe the first person to call himself an anarchist, and who's sometimes thought to be uh, not, not friendly to the free market, but 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 actually he was pro free market. If you actually read his works, I know you can find statements where he says property is revolutionary, property is the bulwark of liberty, property is this this and that. He was sort of in a way, he was sort of postmodern. He liked contradictory statement, statements, but certainly the tenor of his work is pro-individual freedom and against the state. And, he, and while he and Bastiat had many disagreements over economics, they debated the nature of interest and things of that nature and had a lot of differences off, uh, provoked some discussion. Uh, gosh, I hope... Uh, you said something about under pressure. I would admit to call. I would call myself a left libertarian. It makes it sound like I'm somewhat reluctant. I, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't know what you meant by that, but I'll, I'll let that go. Um, I think what left libertarians have in mind. I speak for myself, of course, but I think there'd be agreement from uh, my colleagues at the Center for a Stateless uh, Society and other other uh, other you know uh, free floating left libertarians. But the the idea is. Uh, there's a historical element to this, and then there's there's a whole series, I think, of things that we could call emphases and uh, nuances. Um, well, first of all, we're libertarians, so let's get that out of the way. Uh, I'm a I'm a Rothbardian. I'm a non-proviso Lockean. Uh, I could come up with many more uh, titles for what I am. Uh, I learned my libertarianism from uh, this gentleman right here, Professor Block who I first saw, although I don't believe I met him, but I was in the same room with him in 1969. That dates us, doesn't it? <laughs> New York City. Uh, uh, debate over anarchism between Carl Hess and and uh, and uh, uh, Jerome Tuchilli, as a matter of fact. You may remember that. Uh, uh, I, and, and so I learned my libertarianism from Murray Rothbard, from Laura Block, from Carl Hess, from Roy Childs, from a, a whole group of people. Uh, and I think that's what gave me this left uh, flavor, leftist flavor from the very start. Uh, just to say something historical first, and this is brought out in a nice essay that you can find online by uh, Jeff Riggenbach called Why, Why I, I Am a Left Libertarian. Uh, if you look historically at, at the left, the point is it was rooted in force. They were dispossessed of, of land that they had been living on. Uh, so this is not hardly complete. I hope more and more will come out during the discussion, but at least I give you a flavor of, uh, of what it's about. Okay. Um, and I guess, Walter, we want to you know, generally respond to that, but also if you want to talk about, you know, if you disagree with Sheldon's interpretation of these big libertarian figures, or, you know, what's just... You know what, I'll trust you, just... Do you want to respond to what Sheldon said, and we'll take it from there? Well, I'll give my opening statement sort of uh, similar to uh, Sheldon's. Uh, I, I want to say that Sheldon and I have been friends for, I don't know, more years than either of us want to uh, go back, if I can speak for both of us. And uh, uh, this is sort of a debate among friends, but it is a debate because I do sharply disagree with uh, Sheldon. Uh, not so much with his, his historical analysis. I think he was uh, pretty accurate, but... 
I, I want to show you a picture that I just drew. I hope you can see this. It's sort of like a teepee, uh, an Indian teepee, uh, where there are sticks on the top, and then the NAP, or libertarianism, is right where they all cross. And then below the NAP is deductions from libertarianism. That's the way I see libertarianism. And the, uh, the, the, the dot in the middle, right over here, is the non-aggression principle, and uh, based on property rights, based on homesteading. And, and that's pretty much what libertarianism is. I'm not a left libertarian, nor am I a right libertarian. Uh, they call me Walter Moderate Block, and I'm a moderate <laughs> Because uh, there are right-wing libertarians too. Uh, Ron Paul is a right-wing libertarian. Hans Hoppe is a right-wing libertarian. Uh, uh. Uh, hi there. Welcome to Liberty.me Live. Hi, audience that I hope is out there. Uh, we're here for what's going to be a really exciting show, I hope. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and I'm here with Sheldon Richmond and Walter Block. And you might know me from the internet, but more importantly, you probably know Sheldon Richmond from his work in the Freeman Future of Freedom, lately on Reason.com, and his own uh, free association blog. Sheldon and I also do a free association podcast every two weeks here on Liberty.me. Um, and he's been known to call himself a left libertarian if you pester him at Students for Liberty, speaking personally. <laughs> um, and we also have Walter Block, who... He is a, I don't know if I should read the official names, but he is the eminent scholar, chair in economics at uh, the J.A. Butt School of Business at Loyola University. He is a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn. And he is the author of, I counted 12 books, though I could be uh, miscounting, including uh, Defending the Undefendable. And... Uh, we're here for what is going to be a discussion, not a disagreement, I think was the idea, or not a debate, but basically, I think we want to start with Sheldon telling us in a couple minutes what he considers left libertarianism um, in itself and also kind of separate from just saying libertarianism. So if you want to just... Okay, let me just take a few minutes just to uh, kind of kick things 